Lee, I'm Ian Phillips, I'm from Arm. So one of the things that persistently comes up has been the total lack of understanding of common terms. So when we talk about things like design, we use the term like all design is the same, but it's quite different when you're designing a process or a product or a production line. Uh, and whether you're talking about um, a product which is something that somebody sells or a product which is a service that people utilize and interface with, these are all very different. And so it becomes very important that we understand fundamentals because they are standing in the way of optimizing whatever it is that we do. And thinking of them all as one is a basic problem. Now, I've been using a concept which I've called the capability model for years but I've never found anything really that, uh, that aligns with this terribly well in, uh, in published papers. Um, primarily, I think, because businesses don't do one thing. Businesses do several things, and their products are often different markets. So the idea of you know, a company, and not, not said disrespectfully, like Rolls-Royce, which perhaps does work in a fairly narrow single product market, other businesses are very wide, and they do lots of different things. Uh, their products often consist of several products which are interrelated and going into different markets. So hardware has a support software package which goes into it. The support software actually is bought by totally different customers than the people who buy the hardware. Yet these are products in a, in a concept and it's a, these are complex products. So development is often seen as something that happens once research is perceived by industry as a luxury activity. Now this is, this is a, um, again a statement of reality. In business we're, we're developing product. We are um, not thinking too much about how we do it because we know how to do it. We've done it before. What you're developing in your next product is not fundamentally different to what you've done before. It's only partially different to what you've done before. So you live, you adapt. So it's like bumblebees. They don't know anything about aerodynamics, but somehow they still manage to fly. So it's, it's, this is an important thing. So research is something that percolates into industry rather than is seen as part of industry. Similarly, you get the other way around where the research community tends to see that industry is risk averse um, because it doesn't want to take the outcomes of research. In point of fact, it's, uh, it, neither of these statements are statements of truth. It's just a, a perception from different perspectives. Um, an, innovate, an innovative product is a better one than others with the same background. We, we see this all the time. People are able to produce good products or innovative products with one set of data, and other people produce rubbish products with the same set of data. And this is a, a, an area where we, we need to understand because we're teaching this. We're telling people on, master, on MBAs that this is what product design is about. And that affects business. Because those people, they go out with their MBAs and they, uh, and they encourage business to change. And the danger is they encourage them to change away from something functional into something dysfunctional. So next slide, please. So I've, I've put as an, as an example this uh, Canon camera. Because the, the photography business has gone through a huge change in the last maybe 15 years. 15 years ago, what was the date? 1998, Canon EOS Rebel. One of the best cameras you could buy. All mechanical and optical. Well, there's a tiny bit of electronics associated with the exposure meter in it. But the, the creation of this product was a process which involved a set of technologies which are pretty well exclusive from the ones that you look at today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is the same, the same camera that they produce today. It's, it's got a computer in it. It's got our computer in it. As it happens, Arm is a company, company that supplies computers which go into all sorts of integrated circuits. You're possibly familiar uh, with them, possibly not. It doesn't really matter. But we don't supply chips. We only supply the know-how that people use to design the chips and the chips they put into products. And this is an example of a product. They still have lenses, but they also have displays. They've got analog electronics now, uh, sensors and transducers. They sense focus. Mechanics have become incredibly sophisticated. Micro motors are used for focusing, literally physically rotating the lens. 
batteries and energy storage and media, uh, illumination discharge tubes, plastics and metal, we mustn't forget, however, an important part of this product. You couldn't sell this if it was a bare printed circuit board. It has to be a product, because people buy products, not electronics or the technologies which are inside them. Packaging and robotic assembly. There is an external aspect to technology on this. This thing could not be made by hand. It's actually impossible to make it by hand. It needs manipulation which is too small, too fine to be done by hand. So the assembly and the technologies were external to this. Now, all of these technologies are clearly available to 21st century businesses today. So, next button please. So why couldn't ARM make a camera to compete with Canon? This is a, a kind of fundamental question because you know, all of these technologies are available. It's not like none of them are available. You know, they're all out there somewhere. This part of it, ARM contributes value for. But So why couldn't ARM make a camera? Well, the answer is, technically it could. But there are some things that it doesn't know about. And I realise that this is, it's not so much that it hasn't got the, the technology out there. It's that it isn't in the business. And so I introduced the idea of capabilities then, because ARM can't produce a camera because it hasn't got various key capabilities inside the business to do it. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so capabilities li limit a business's product options. And you have to bear that in mind, because businesses are not about um, doing anything other, primarily, than making money. Their investors make sure that they don't stray too far off the line. So if we were going to go into the, into the camera business, our investors would run away from ARM because we're a, a, a microprocessor company, not a camera company. So our investors run away, devastating to the business. But whatever it is that you choose to do as a product, it's clear that you need to have the appropriate set of capabilities. And I'm important, being significant at this point on the S, the plural. These are capabilities, not a single capability. ARM makes a range of different products and it needs a different set of capabilities for different products. So even some products which are very similar sounding, like a 32-bit and a 64-bit architecture CPU, actually has some additional, C additional capabilities required for the 64-bit part. A lot of other capabilities are still the same, and capabilities are not all about technology, they're also about business. So we couldn't sell a camera even if we made it because we have no connections with the high street. We don't have any experiences running a big factory to actually do assembly of these things. So there's lots of capabilities that are not related specifically to technology. Next slide. So one of the big problems that I experienced from the research community saying how come our science doesn't get accepted by business, from the business community how come science isn't relevant to what I need. And, they, and realize that these capabilities are a set, as far as product is concerned, that stands between the concept of a product and the delivery of the product. Essentially, you need all of them. Now, science, which looks good, it's understandable, it means that we understand something and we can control something that didn't, we didn't know before. Science contributes to that, but seldom on a one-to-one -one basis to product. So science with other sciences maybe becomes a technology which is something which is ready there's definitions of it here but I've not got time to read them out something which is ready for commercial exploitation doesn't mean to say it's in the company yet so it's like optical uh, technologies associated with a camera and arm not having them and similarly a range of technologies comes together to produce a capability but this also applies as I say to business it's not just related so you do have this kind of hierarchical relationship here that a product embodies capabilities, uh, capabilities embody technologies and sciences embodied in technologies. Now that hierarchical thing is important, but that's the, that's the product specific view of it. If you turned it around the other way, you would find that science goes into several products. So it's actually quite wide ranging. That just shows where research and development activities fit, which is also very useful to know. And finally, then, the capability model as a, an in, as a separate expression. Um, I don't need to talk my way through that at the moment, but it is essentially uh, the, the interface between science and product. It's where 
the research community can provide its technology into an environment which it's going to be used for exploitation. There is seldom a one-to-one -one relationship between these, but if you look at the model that I presented, a one-to-one -one is not disallowed, it's just unusual. I'll stop at that point and we can have any discussions about it later if we want to. Thank you very much.